Thank you, Scott, and some great songs there. And it's great to be coming together around God's Word. We're coming up to our AGM, and of course, I just want to survey a little bit of the brief letter of Titus. In fact, I plan to do it at the end of last year, as in the beginning of this year, but things have gone a bit skew with. You know, a lot's been said today about church life, church growth, church planting, um, church dynamics. We could be more specific and, you know, should you have small midweek meetings or one larger group and what are the best courses for training people? What meetings should we have? What processes do we need? Where's the, what's the place of discipleship? What sort of factors impose, impede church growth? Is it impose? I don't know why, but impede church growth. And what factors help it? You know, what helps things along? What hinders it along? Paul left Titus in Crete in order to set things in order that were lacking or wanting. So we might expect that if the thing's lacking, Paul would now set it out and say some of those things that are lacking. That he would go through how to set a church up and some of these dynamic principles for church growth and so forth. You'd expect them to be answered. But they're not. Paul is giving Titus instructions how to bring order to the church, but he doesn't go into the structures or the processes or the meetings. And it's not that they're unimportant because we do need structures and processes and we do do certain things a certain way, but most of those things are context-specific. What works in PNG uh, may not work in Australia. Over there they love their church buildings to have a little gap at the bottom of the the buildings so that uh, there's a breeze comes through on all those bare feet. You know, it's just more comfortable to have a bit of circulation there. Um, Murraylands Baptist Church has their Bible study on a Friday night. Uh, a lot of other churches would say have a youth group meeting on a Friday night. Is one wrong and the other right? No, of course not. Paul is wanting to focus when he comes to his letter on something central and universal. He's discipling people with the gospel. He's going to leave the processes and the meetings and so forth for Titus and the local church to work out. What we're going to see is that Paul is going to emphasise people. He's going to emphasise discipleship and, and the character of people and the working of God within those people. So let's come and turn back to the book of Titus. Thank you, Roman, for reading that for us. What are the things that he wants to set in order that are wanting or lacking? Lord willing, we'll get to Titus 1, 1 to 4 this evening. Right now we're in verse 5. <clears throat> Titus 1, 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, not a striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Let's pray. Hey, Heavenly Father, we just ask your blessing upon the reading of your word. Lord, we ask as we gather round that our thoughts would be upon what you would be saying to us. Uh, there is a message for each of us here. Also, Lord, we would, as we come before you now, there would be particular requests that each of us would be lifting up to you. Lord, you know those things upon our heart and our mind, whether it's relationships or finances or employment or schooling, whatever it might be, uh, family issues. Lord, we lift it up to you. Lord, you know all these things that are on our heart. Lord, we thank you we can gather here this morning and as we come around your word, we do so with a great joy and a delight. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> the first item that Paul is going to raise is simply leadership. Paul has preached the gospel, he's um, founded the church, he's begun to disciple new believers, but he'd left before they had appointed 
elders. So let's just think about it. He's come, he's trained, he's discipled up men, but he's had no time to appoint elders. You would have thought that he would have done that all at the same time. You would have thought, why doesn't why hasn't he just done it all at the, the, the same time? Paul answers that question probably in 1 Timothy where he says the elder is not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. It's one of the hazards of church leadership, pride. Paul told Timothy not to lay hands on anyone uh, or ordain them to a ministry hastily. And then he goes on a few verses later on to say, I talk about the sins of some people are plain to see and their sins go ahead of them to judgment, but the sins of others are seen only later. He's going to say that it takes time to evaluate what's happening in a person's life. And while you can come and you can disciple and train up people quickly, this idea of church leadership, no, you've got to take your time. There's um, got to see what really happens. We need time to see a person's character and uh, time reveals truths that may not be immediately obvious so Paul had left Titus behind to make some decisions about character of these people that he's already seen saved and he's, he's been consistent on his first missionary journey Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra and Derby. But then later on in Acts 14, he comes back to those uh, same places and, and uh, he talks about confirming them, encouraging them. But then he also says he appoints elders in every church. So Paul's got this strategy as he goes into the pagan cultures. He, he preaches the gospel there and we can see his heart. He wants people to get saved. He wants them to be changed by the gospel. We're going to have a bit of a look at that tonight in verses 1 to 4. Then he gets them organised, these groups, together into local churches and he wants them in local churches with leadership. And it's a strategy of church planting is that they would have the leadership. They just don't begin out of nowhere and, and uh, it happens by itself. No, leadership and direction is something that Paul sees as being important. In verse Five, he says he wishes to see elder-led or elder-influenced congregations in every city or town. Have a look in verse 5. For this cause left I, left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. We should ask ourselves, is it important to be planting Churches like Paul was, we should be saying yes, and growing churches. You know, I would have loved to have this church to have planted a church. It hasn't happened, but uh, it'd be something that we should all be looking at. It's an important point to make here, though, that through Titus and the other epistles, Paul isn't teaching a lot on church government and how you set things up. He's talking more so on the character of people, especially the spiritual character. In verse 9, he suggests there needs to be stable leadership. Have a look in verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word, he's talking about the, the elders or the bishops, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So these men have been taught something and they're going to be faithful to hang on to it. They're not being swayed this way and that way by false doctrine. Um, and further, they're able to disciple others. They're able to, to um, share this doctrine because it's been taught and it's been passed along to others. So what do you look for in the elder or the bishop, in fact? Verse, <coughs> excuse me. Verse 5 talks about elder and verse 6 it just runs on to bishop. And uh, the word elder or presbyteros, it just means a, a senior. So we get the denomination Presbyterian from that word. And the word bishop simply means an overseer or a superintendent, someone that's overseeing the work. And of course we get that comes from the word episkopos and so we get the word Episcopalian church. 
So what do you look for in a man that's going to lead the church? Should they be dynamic and inspiring? Or should they be um, a gifted and so they're able to draw all these people together? Is this, is, what Paul, is this what Paul is going to set out? Should they be an entrepreneur or a bit of a businessman? No. Paul is more interested in the type of person you are. Have a look in verse 6 again. He says, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Blameless doesn't mean perfect. You would never have a, an elder if that was the case. <clears throat> it means they're of good reputation. You can't um, make an accusation as such against them. The husband of one wife is a, is a curly one. It's been debated uh, a lot. It means a one-woman man. And what it doesn't mean is that the elders could have only one wife and everybody else could have two because polygamy wasn't allowed in the church. Paul is not saying a, a widower who was remarried cannot be an elder because many scriptures say the widower can remarry. Nor does it mean that an elder must be married or it said or it would have said it that way, there needs to be a married man. Paul may well have been an elder in Antioch, as we read through scripture, before he stepped into the role as apostle as a single man. What gets curly is that Paul, does Paul mean a divorced and remarried man? Is that a one-woman man? But we see in scriptures both our Lord Jesus Christ and Paul accepted divorce and remarriage for the innocent party. Or you say, not and not for the unfaithful partner. Paul would have talked about divorce here if that was a disqualification. Um, you could argue then, well, is a divorced person uh, blameless? Or do, what sort of reputation do they have? And, and that's a, a hard line or a cruel line to go down. Paul is actually giving a higher qualification. And he's saying it's simply what we would say if it's a one-woman man. It means he's a faithful man to one woman. And it's got the idea of not just outwardly, but also inwardly. So his mind is set only on his wife, inwardly and outwardly. He's not a flirt. He's not out there chasing other women. He's not into pornography. He's not doing all of these other things that are such a, a lure today. Um, it's a high qualification. He's faithful to his wife, both inwardly and outwardly. Our Lord Jesus said that anyone that looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery in his heart. So a man with adulterous thoughts does not qualify with this title of being a one-woman man with one woman on his heart. Can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? A person can steal, the scriptures say, and then they can repay it back. They can make compensation. But if a person gets into adultery, it, it, it hurts the heart especially. And the uh, Bible, the Proverbs, tells us this repro reproach shall not be wiped away. How, how do you compensate someone for a, adultery? I'm thankful in saying that, though, there is a place of forgiveness. There's a place of restoration. If someone's been in adultery, they can be forgiven and they can be restored. But Paul is saying we want those in the role of overseers and, and stewards and, and superintendents to be blameless in these areas. He wants them to be not to have this where someone can lay an accusation and, uh, um, and bring you down today. Then it goes on to saying, having faithful children, not accused of riot. And here it's referring to little children. Young children's beliefs should reflect their home life and and as they grow older, we all know they'll, they'll go their own road. Uh, they'll be responsible for their own behaviours. In either case, the small children should be under the influence of their godly parents and the godly parents should be discipling them. So as small children, they'll be obedient. They won't be riot or um, it, it's got the idea of being um, wild or disobedient. If there's trouble... In leading their family, there'll be trouble in leading the church. And so there's a picture there of well, what will be compounded, what happens in the family will become compounded in the church life. We're living in a crazy world today. We've got this gender dysphoria. A girl may feel like a boy or a, 
a boy may not know what he even feels like. And Paul is saying men should be men. Men should stand up and be what they're meant to be. There are, there are men that has never grown up. There are some men that want to live a single life all their lives in the sense of, well, come weekend, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to go hunting, fishing, whatever I want to do, you know, or get my four-wheel drive out and never stop and, and never spend time with their family. Men are to be role models of men. They're to be Christ-like. And we Christ-like in his very essence was unselfish. He was giving Men are to so act that their family flourishes. Men are to be acting so that their families are successful. They're looking after their family. They're they're, um, spending time with their children. They're spending time with their wives. Churches need to be a place that encourage men and train them up as such. It's an important part of Paul's teaching here. In verse 6, we've just looked at, Elders are to be blameless in the home. And then in verse 7, they're to be blameless in character. Have a look in verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. He's just listed five negatives. Let me go over them quickly. He's not to be self-willed or overbearing or bossy. How can you be Christ-like with bossy leadership? Not soon angry or quick-tempered. Not given to wine. He's not to be a drunk. He's not to be a heavy drinker. He's no striker. He's not violent. He's not a, a bully. He's not given to filthy lucre. or He's not dishonest in business. He's not, ma- he's not a maker of the quick buck at someone else's expense. And then in verse 8, Paul gives eight positives to look for but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. He's a lover of hospitality. He's friendly. He's a friendly bloke. And that should be the spirit of the church that would come through. We're friendly to strangers. We're friendly to anyone that comes through. A lover of good men. And there's a lot more in this than we mentioned because it also includes good things. He's a lover of the good things of life and good company and uh, good things. And uh, he... Next point, he's sober or he's self-controlled or he's sensible. Then he's just or he's upright or he's fair dinkum. Then the next point, he's holy or he's pure. Then he's temperate or he's disciplined or he's self-controlled. So Paul is not after the people with the best skills in the church. He's after those with the, the best heart and those with good character. He's concerned with character. Why would he be so concerned with character rather than skills? Great skills can be destructive. Great talent can be very destructive. Some of the the greatest tyrants in the world have been very gifted men. They've been able to rally people behind them and take them uh, and follow them. Um, They have their great skills. But a church is not like an organisation a great leader can come to power in a church and they last for a while and then they'll, they'll crash and they'll take the church with them because a, the church is a spiritual organism. Or a person with great power in the flesh and ability in the flesh will build up the church and we can see it around here and I can name some examples of churches that have that are built up and they're growing, going on and they're getting bigger and stronger and good fellowship, but it's not a spiritual church and the people are dying. The particular one that I'm thinking of was a church that had a, a, a lesbian minister. Yeah. So I'm only saying that because that's, it's not right by scripture. But obviously the church is growing. The church is, is growing in people. It's growing in their finances. But is that what we want? And Paul's really saying, you know, look look at the character of the church you're going to build and it'll come back to these sort of spiritual qualifications. You can get gifted people that will maybe a businessman that will grow a church like a, a business. But the spiritual life will be dead. Failure to teach truth, and this is what the elders and the teachers should be doing, often starts with a failure to live morally. 
The potential overseer must be someone who is not known for being given to filthy lucre or dishonest gain. And there are some in the Christian circles that they want to get preaching itineraries. They want to get out and about and do a various preaching purely for the money. We had a man uh, some years back, most would probably forgot now, but he wanted to come here to be an assistant uh, pastor with me. And uh, he was obviously from overseas. But he wanted me to, to fill the papers out and call him. And he said, well, if we promised him this certain amount of money that he could live by, and he was, it was a reasonable amount, he said, don't you worry about that. If I come, I'm into computers, I can support myself. That's not a problem. I just want you to lie about how much you're going to offer me. I mean, can you imagine how we would have been if we'd put something pen to paper, we're going to give you this amount of money, and then he arrives, and if he doesn't get that amount of money, that happened. Some of you might have met him because he came a year or two later and stood at the back of the church and, and had a drink with everybody, and then he moved on to the other churches. But he wanted to come out and be sponsored in. And I know part of it is cultural, but I didn't like his bangles. He's had a number of gold bangles on his wrist. And yet he talks about being someone that, oh, I wanted to go into these remote areas and give the gospel out. And, and he had little soft hands. Do you remember him, John? Vaguely. <laughs> what I'm saying is there are people like that. And I got rung up by some other churches. Would you like to have him come and preach? He's a man of God. And I thought, No. Hey, people are like that. They're, they're, they're out after money. Look at Titus 1.11. He's talking about the unruly, the, the vain speakers. Verse 11, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. They're teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. There are men that will teach things simply for filthy lucre or simply for dishonest gain. And faulty desires, the wrong desires, will lead to wrong teaching. And if you're going to have teaching that's attractive, it needs to be a little bit different. There's got to be a sense of novelty or maybe controversy about it. Oh, look, I've just got this new, the new answers. Oh, I can think of another church that said, this is, we're getting back to the Bible, everybody else is wrong, and we've got the answers, and everybody can flock to that. Oh, this, we're so good because we've got the, the, the answers, and maybe some new teaching comes out, or someone drifts through, and they've got this, and he's writing a book about it, and we all flock, but yeah, this must be true. And Hey, I, I gave it some thought. We've just been this last year, we've been going through the book of Romans. I've loved it. But, you know, I can't think of anything new in the book of Romans that I could sell a book on. I, I can't think of any new novel way of, of writing it up and, and uh, putting it out that isn't already been said. But I'd need to say something novel to be able to sell a book. Actually, I, I'm not being critical of those that write books and, and do a fantastic job. I'm not doing that at all. All I'm saying is often people want something novel and they'll chase something novel. Uh, or, or something f different. And when you come a lot to the scriptures, the, uh, some of those truths that are handed down from generation to generation by great preachers, they're the truth that we hold to. It's not necessarily something new. In Romans, we read one serious reason people do not no God is because they hold the truth down. That's in Romans 1. They suppress the truth. Knowing God, they hold the truth. In unrighteousness, it says, they're holding it down. They're, they're not letting truth be truth. They know what the truth is. And as they do that, the Bible says their thinking becomes futile. They become stupid. And one of the signs that they're stupid is that they won't glorify God and they won't give God thanks. So let me say that principle another way. If you harden your heart to the truths of God, your thinking will become darkened and you'll be separated from the life of God. 
And it will be seen, especially in teachers, that won't glorify God, nor are they thankful to God. And it can be seen in our lives. So we need to do a check of ourselves. Are we thankful to God? Do we glorify God in our circumstances? How is your praise life going? Tragically and dangerously, church leaders, we're not immune to this. It's possible for leaders to suffer shipwreck with regard to the faith. Paul talks to Timothy about that because they don't hold a good conscience. They've got to have a good conscience before the Lord and do that which is right or they could be shipwrecked. And in the context of 1 Timothy, it was not intellectual doubts. It's not false doctrine that had drawn them away from Christ. They were eager for money. Paul Paul's words to Timothy spell it out, 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Some leaders covet after money. It is a danger and we're all vulnerable. We're all vulnerable to the thought of we'd like to have more money. We'd like to, even just for the things that it can buy and the things that it can do. We like to think that we're rational people, that we don't have a bias, that we don't have a sinful bias within us. But we do. We tend to justify the sinful things that we do. Our desires can drive our thinking and they shouldn't. So Paul puts forward not only what a church leader, that a church leader should be blameless in the home, But he should be blameless in his character because it's out of the character that the teaching will come. And then he goes on to say, be blameless in doctrine. Have a look in verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So there's two aspects here. To exhort and convince. He's to encourage and to refute. Again, the emphasis not so much on the skills of teaching, but on holding fast to the truth. Folks, do you have a passion for the truth? Are you thrilled that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Saviour? Do you praise God for that? Are you thankful? Do you draw, what, desire to draw close to God that, that you will have more and more light on your life? You see, the more we turn away, the more our thinking gets stupid or futile because our minds get darkened but we've only got to turn a little bit to God and God answers with more light and more and more to God and God will give us more and more light and the right decisions and things will start to take its right place and and God will bless that and and in the church group it starts with leadership and and uh, this is what Paul is saying this is where he's putting his emphasis here is back on leadership do we have a passion for truth Do we exhort and encourage others by sound doctrine? Do we convince or refute those who oppose sound doctrine? These elders or overseers in the church are to hold fast the faithful word. And so the church is to hold fast to the faithful word. And the faithful word is all about something absolutely wonderful, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's he's like a jewel that when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we start to look at him, He's like a jewel that's got many colours and as the light shines up, we see something else. Oh, the Lord Jesus is absolutely wonderful. I know forgiveness and there's a light in that, there's a jewel in that. But he's also a friend and there's a, there's a whole light in that. But he's also a companion in times of trouble and, and there's a whole beauty in that. And, and the more we get to understand the Lord Jesus, the more we realise who he is, he's altogether wonderful. He, he's altogether beautiful. He's altogether fascinating because we can know more about it. And there's no end to infinity, folks, to having our souls satisfied. And programs, and and I'm not knocking programs, but I'm saying putting the emphasis on programs or dynamic ways of doing things isn't what Paul is doing. He's saying, draw close to God. Know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour and look for that in your leaders. And may the leaders shine that, that the church may also have that. And this is what Paul is going to go on and say, and this is what we're desiring to encourage as we come up to our AGM, that we might have the right heart, 
that we might seek out the Lord's face, that we will not go after a business model but after a spiritual model. May our leaders and may our people be blameless in displaying Christ-likeness. Not perfect. We all need to be forgiven. But blameless in displaying Christ-likeness so that the church may also display the beauty of Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for the words of scripture. We thank you for this little book of Titus and the opportunity to look at it. Lord, I again would just pray for those unspoken requests of the people, perhaps with things upon their heart. We pray for in the next, within the next few weeks, uh, uh, Lord willing, Rob Boy will visit us. We can hear some of the work that's been happened at Alatow and uh, thank you for Brother Hunter there. The souls have been saved. Lord, I'd also bring that church in Alatow before you. We know that there's gangs, there's been five murders there. There's gang murders going on. And Lord, how difficult it would be to move around and walk places when there are gangs with their guns. And the houses there that need their high fences and dogs. Something very different to what we have. So we pray for that church in Alatow at Eastern Sky and the other groups that meet as well. Lord, we're mindful of their needs and uh, we just thank you that we can have a heart for other people. We would also think of our brothers and sisters in bonds. Lord, we're mindful there are other people around the world that are in prison for their faith. They've been in prison because they're Christians and not Muslims and they're not given a fair go. They're given the, the worst jobs. Well, may we stop and slow down and pray for our brothers and sisters in, un, in great trial. May we identify with these people. Lord, I also thank you for the great movement of the underground church through China and many of these countries. There are people that are so on fire for you, of a heart to serve you, to love you, to know you. And the persecution is small compared to the love of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be praying for them. May we also be searching our hearts that we might rediscover our first love. We thank you and praise you. Amen.